Do you ever feel like you're not getting any traction with your filmmaking or that maybe the dream of getting paid to travel the world with your camera just isn't realistic? Well, you're not alone there. And by far the hardest part of any career in filmmaking is getting it off the ground. Once you have some momentum behind you, things tend to flow quite a bit more smoothly, but getting from zero to one can be a serious grind. But in my experience, there are a few key mistakes I see a lot of new filmmakers making when it comes to their careers. And so in this video, I'm gonna break down five of the most common ones so that you can hopefully save yourself some heartache and get things moving in the right direction as quickly as possible. Okay, so right off the bat, just know that you aren't alone here. Even though I've been lucky enough to shoot for some of the biggest outlets in the world, my own career took ages to get going. From the first time I committed to trying to earn a living with a camera to the time I got my first paid assignment was nearly two years, I think. Eventually, things did start to work out for me, and now here we are today where I haven't done anything else but shoot for the last 10 plus years. So looking back at the whole process and where I see a lot of people going wrong along the way, what are the most common mistakes new or early career filmmakers should avoid if they plan to be in this business for the long term. Well, the very first rookie mistake is probably the fault of YouTube and the content consumerist industrial complex, and that's over-investing in gear at the start of your career. We're constantly bombarded with new gear that promises to be a million times better than the last generation, and we're always told that without a certain thing, there's no way we can succeed. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that gear doesn't matter, as cool as it is to say that these days, because gear absolutely does matter, just maybe not in the way the manufacturers want you to think it does. The mistake I see a lot of people making early on is spending so much on gear that there's nothing left over for investing in a project or in themselves through education or training. Like grabbing a fully rigged out FX6 package right out of the gate might seem tempting, but it's not going to make you any better and it's not going to bring in work just because you own it. Don't do that. And just to be totally clear, I'm also not saying that making long-term investments into gear is a bad idea because it's not at all. You should take a good look at the market and where you think it's headed and buy into systems that have a clear upgrade path so that you can grow into a better and better kit over time. Like, do you have your eye on FX6 in the long term? Then it doesn't really make sense to spend money on a micro four third system that you're just going to have to sell at a big loss in a year or two. Take it from me, someone who invested a bunch of money into Nikon stuff at the start of my career, I just sold a lens that I paid $2,000 for for 250 bucks. And don't sleep on used gear either because I've only ever bought one new camera in my entire career, which meant I was able to afford much better stuff than I would have if I'd bought new. Like this Sony FX9 over my shoulder that looks all fancy and pretty under the lights, that's used. In keeping with the trend of doing things too early, the next mistake I see newer filmmakers making over and over again is also probably the fault of online influencers as well, and that's quitting your day job to go full-time too soon. I think this trend might be toning down a little bit, thankfully, but it's been really popular for a while to hear stories of people just quitting in a blaze of glory to follow their passions. I'm ruined! <laughs> The problem with that is that in order to keep going as freelance creatives, we need income. And honestly, most of us will have some sort of day job for the rest of our lives. The brutal truth is that independent documentaries, for the most part anyways, don't make very much money. If you do a great job, you will be rewarded by people coming to you to ask you to shoot projects for them in a similar style. But to me, that's just another form of a day job. The idea that you can tell everyone off at the office and then walk away to only do what you want for the rest of your life just isn't realistic. So keeping a day job until you're really sure you're on the right track is a much safer path. Even me, after more than a decade of doing this stuff at a pretty high level, I make only a very small portion of my income shooting things I'm really passionate about. When I'm lucky, my day job involves shooting on really high-end projects that I believe in, but a large chunk of my income comes from things like survival shows and branded content and the odd reality TV gig. So if you've got a solid job that still gives you the freedom to make your own work in your spare time, my advice would be to hold on to that for a little longer than you might want to. Build up some savings and a really good emergency fund, get a decent kit that you know how to use blindfolded, and make sure that if you do decide to go the full-time filmmaking route, that you're ready for it. Because believe me, burning all your bridges in the name of following your dreams looks good in the movies, but more often than not, it's not the best way. 
Okay, moving on, I've said a bunch of times on this channel that when you're just starting out, you need to shoot spec projects in order to show people what you're capable of so that they know that you're up to the job. Without a portfolio of examples, no one is gonna just take your word for it that you're a good shooter. In the beginning, when no one is paying you to shoot, you're gonna have to shoot these portfolio pieces yourself. But one of the biggest mistakes I see early career filmmakers making is that they aim way too big with these projects and then never end up doing them because the scope is just unmanageable. At this stage, you need to think smaller and think local as much as you can. To give you a personal example, I have a really talented friend who's at the start of his filmmaking journey and he's had some really impressive early career success and is now starting to book enough jobs to support himself full time. The problem is the jobs he's getting aren't really in line with what he wants to be doing long term. We've talked a bunch of times about how the only way to break into this cycle is for him to start making things in his own way to show people what he can do, but the issue is that for the last four years I've known him, he's been planning the same project a big international shoot in the Himalayas that sounds amazing, but is really hard logistically to pull off. It's expensive and time consuming and his work schedule keeps getting in the way of actually making it. So now years later, he hasn't shot a single frame and nothing has really progressed. Compare that with my mentorship student, Dwi. He's been saving money by working on a fishing boat all year. And then in his free time, he goes out and shoots small local stories that are all within driving distance of his house. He racked up like four of these things in under a year. And even though they might not be massive epic stories, they're really Really well done and showcase what he can do. The last time we talked, he told me that off the back of the most recent one, he just booked two major jobs, one for over like 10 grand. And it's starting to look like if he keeps this up, he'll be done working on the boats in no time. In my opinion, this approach is so much better because instead of having one dream project on paper that never actually gets made, Dwi has pumped out a full portfolio of great work that he's been able to use to drum up real paying client work. Now let's take a look at one of the classic mistakes. And this is another one that Dwi is definitely not making and that's thinking that opportunities are gonna come to you. Because even though every once in a while something golden falls into your lap out of nowhere, most of the time the best opportunities out there come as a result of some sort of action that you've taken. Have you ever heard the expression strike while the iron is hot? Well, when it comes to filmmaking, the much better attitude is make the iron hot by striking. Let me give you a personal example from almost 10 years ago when I was just starting to gain traction in my career as a photojournalist but hadn't gotten any really big gigs yet. I was living in Cambodia and I'd done some really cool assignments for big name outlets like the New York Times and Al Jazeera. But I had I hadn't gotten anything that lasted for more than a few days and I was kind of desperate to work on something a bit more long term. So instead of waiting around to see when the next email for a one or two day shoot would come in, I did something completely illogical. I bought an eight meter long fishing boat with one of my best friends and we decided to drive it around Southeast Asia's largest lake for no reason at all. No one had asked us to do this and there was no commercial viability to the project whatsoever. In fact, a bunch of our colleagues in the press corps told us straight up that this was a dumb idea and that we were waiting wasting our time. But we went for it anyways, and one morning we pushed off from the ferry terminal and headed towards the Tonle Sap Lake. Over the three weeks we were gone, I actually lost money, not only in the cost of the supplies and the boat, because I had to turn down paying jobs I couldn't take because I was gone. Now along the way, we documented the entire trip in photo and a bit of video, and when we got back, I made a long form blog post about it. Yes, this is in the days when blogging was still the cool thing to do online. I'm old, I know. As far as we knew, that was the end of it. We'd taken a risk, done something unusual, and that was good enough. But then something really weird happened. Two weeks later, I got an email out of the blue from an aid organization in Singapore asking us if we'd be willing to apply our same style of working to document the entirety of the Mekong River from sea to source. Now, obviously that sounded like a dream project for an early career photographer and filmmaker, but what was even crazier was the fact they were willing to give us an $80,000 budget to make it happen. That kicked off a huge project that we worked on on and off for over two years. And is to this day still one of the best experiences of my life. When it was over, I had an incredible portfolio of photos and a bit of video that I used to get accepted into an application-only masterclass sponsored by Nikon with two of my favorite photographers in the world, and then later to get into the New York Times portfolio review where I pitched a short film to the media departments, some of the world's biggest newspapers. And all of that happened because two idiots bought a boat. The payoffs for the things we do might take months or even years to come, but what never works is sitting back and waiting. So don't wait for the iron to get hot, make it hot through action. Do Doing is the only thing that will get results. 
Last up on this list of mistakes to avoid is a really common one, and that's to not view the world and the work of others with a student's mindset. Most of us get into the world of filmmaking partly because we like and admire the work other people have done in the past, and we want to make our own impact on the world by adding work of our own to the creative pile. In the words of the legendary podcast producer of This American Life, Ira Glass, All of us who do creative work, like, you know, we get into it, and we get into it because we have good taste. But when we're just starting out, our abilities aren't at the same level where we can actually match our taste. In short, we're not good enough to make the work we want. We watch films made by other people we admire and we think, I don't know, maybe our work will never be as good as theirs, and that can lead into a spiral of negative thinking. But the people who progress quickly and get their skills caught up to their taste are the people who ask why they like other people's work so much. In other words, they study their industry with a student's mindset. A good student doesn't just accept the fact that the doc see a fire looks amazing, they sit back and analyze it to figure out why. Like, is it because of the really carefully composed frames and how they use tripods to make for an unusually cinematic documentary? Is it because they had impressive access to the Italian Navy, also the ordinary families in Sicily, and the migrant boats themselves? Was it more powerful because of the timeliness of the issue when it came out? A student doesn't just watch that film and go, man, that was great, I'll never be that good. They think about why it was good, and then they try to apply those lessons to their next project so that it's better than their last one, and so they inch their skills a little bit closer towards matching their taste. So if you're just starting out and your first or even your fifth short film isn't what you want it to be, instead of freaking out about how good everyone else is, start studying. Just accepting that others are better than you is for rookies. A professional wants to know why. So there we are. Five mistakes I see new filmmakers making and some thoughts on how to avoid them yourself. If you do all these things, I think you'll find you get much better, much faster. Hope that one helped, and if you did find it useful, you might want to check out my free guide to career planning that will help you set long-term goals and stay on track. There's a link in the description, and it won't cost you a cent. See ya!